Welcome to Remainders, where we talk all things movies. My name is Patrick McIntyre. With me always is the multi-talented Darren Varell. And today we're going to be talking the horror comedy, cult classic, rock opera, possibly my favorite De Palma film, The Phantom of the Paradise. Uh, Darren, good to see you. Are you as excited as I am today? I'm very excited. It's an early morning episode of Remainders. I'm in my pajamas mostly. Um, <laughs> nice. Yeah. All right. Let's talk super weird 70s uh, cinema. You know, Brian De Palma's best film. OK, we'll see about that. But I did love this film and I'm excited to talk about it. Thanks for introducing it to me. I mean, it was on Criterion a month ago. Yeah, I, yep. I skipped over it for whatever reason. I just wasn't interested in like a rock opera. But then you know when i started to like read a little bit more about it i did become more and more interested just like okay is it a horror movie is it phantom of the opera it like and then right off the bat when you you know start to watch this film you start to realize like oh it actually might have some good music to it as well so um yeah there's a lot to unravel but brian de palma making this film is such a weird choice um early i mean this is early uh, relatively early in his career this is two years before carrie so yeah, yeah. and i mean i think that's my, maybe i guess from what i've read it it didn't do too well when it opened um but it looks no. like it's been gaining some momentum obviously with anytime criterion adds it to um their library it looks like you know there's more eyes on it it's it's thought about a little bit differently and we always talk on this podcast about um films and how they'll age uh so it's nice to see that this one is getting some recognition uh yes we'll definitely have a lot to go into with that uh just really quick note uh so the ramones t-shirt are those officially your pajamas for everybody who's not on youtube right now i just want to well, point out that was... darren has great pajamas if that's the case, so. <laughs> yeah you know it's funny because uh this is one of my favorite shirts i, I really love wearing yep. this rock and roll high school shirt uh if anybody is um listening and not seeing it it's the what the poster was um with the school blowing up and everything in the background and yes uh i did wear this to bed last night but not on purpose <laughs> it's not like these are my pajamas it's just because i was working literally up until like five in the morning I've, I've gotten a few hours of sleep last night um so it's uh my pajamas by uh you know me just passing out <laughs> yeah by necessity You're the hardest working man i know man and you keeping it real with that so i came across <laughs> yeah. i came across the rock and roll high school uh steel book and i almost picked that up the other day so oh I'm, there's a steel book of it out yeah yeah uh i'm pretty sure it was steel book it was like a behind a case but uh i really wanted to pick it up but it'll get behind a that, case so. because i mean it's such an explosive film <laughs> right exactly yeah <laughs> so phantom of the paradise just a quick rundown for in case you haven't seen that phantom of paradise directed by brian de palma in 1974 uh it is about a songwriter tricked in uh by a music producer mogul swan into sacrificing his life's work a long-form rock opera based on the life of faust uh after being being framed in a prison, he succumbs to a freak accident and is burned and loses his face and his voice. In the pursuit of revenge, he decides to destroy Swan's opening rock club, The Paradise. But in doing so, he discovers a singer he adores, Phoenix, and instead wants her to sing his rock opera. Um, this uh this is one of my favorite De Palma films uh I didn't say it was this best film uh I I give no objective opinions on this podcast I just want to make that clear but this is definitely revisiting this one again um because I've watched this multiple times over the years this is uh pretty easily my uh, favorite movie of his to watch where I could just put it on at any time any point in the movie over the years I've watched it multiple times and uh it is one that I really really love uh you I watched this um back to back with blowout in my early 20s when I was kind of really just discovering um uh De Palma and who he was I had seen like earlier De Palma movies but not really appreciating uh completely different films yeah for sure it was just not me stylistically kind of really you know that's the yeah. thing yeah. yeah exactly but that's what's great about him is they can work in so many genres but yeah so i watched this back to back when i was 20 and then you had us watch blowout and that was the first time i had watched that in years and that is still probably his masterpiece on certainly on a technical level but uh this one like i said i've revisited this multiple times it's kind of always like an october one for me to watch 
Um, this one just has stayed with me over the years, and I absolutely love it. It's I'm not really one for musicals in general, but uh, this is definitely one that I've always enjoyed. Unsurprisingly, rock horror, comedy, rock opera, you know, it, it's just kind of uh, flows right into my jam. So so I'm glad that you uh, took the time to watch it then, because, yeah, I was uh, really excited when I heard that you hadn't seen this one because uh we love to palm on this podcast quite a bit and uh you know digging up uh with some movies that maybe we kind of missed over the years I, there's still a couple that i hadn't seen and that you showed me that uh yeah just, like uh, sisters and stuff like that yeah yeah and um it's been great to kind of do that research uh, uh on the podcast itself so yeah and um for the listeners out there that are just um being introduced to this um this movie it's fun it's really fun. It's uh, you wouldn't expect that out of an early De Palma film because you know, yeah. I feel like early De Palma films he was really experimenting with who he was. Um, you do get like his Hitchcock, his classic Hitchcock sort of ripoff stuff here, but yep. in a fun way, <laughs> uh, which is cool. You know, like that's the thing is like he's playing with things that ultimately he'll be known for, and that's what's a cool um watch. You know, this director, this um, I would think that he's got to be you know go down in history as one of the best directors of all time and and here he is um kind of experimenting with a oh, different genre that i don't think i don't think since or before he had ever done any kind of musical um and so and unsurprisingly um the directing is really good uh there's that scene uh, and we'll talk about it but uh that when that guy gets electrocuted i mean I, I genuinely was like jaw on the floor like this is so good yeah. it was done so well it was so funny but yet so shocking and, and i don't know i just i really that was one of my favorite parts of the film um and then you talk the about the actual like electro uh electrocution when like the cat it has got like uh jolted uh editing yeah the cutting of yeah. that part so but uh, also you know that's that that's the thing is like um ye, these moments are laugh out loud funny uh you know and they kind of come up unsuspecting like if you've never seen it like me um and you're watching it for the first time uh you're kind of like holy holy shit this is insane yeah i mean that is definitely one of its strength uh it was received like uh from what i understand like kind of mildly uh critically when it first came out but uh as you said as you mentioned it's definitely gained a lot of cult notoriety i know winnipeg actually had a phantom palooza uh in the early 2000s because uh for some reason that town uh celebrated the movie uh, ever since it uh, was released and so they kept its uh, status going um but yeah like it certainly is a movie that it, you don't know where it's going to go every scene is um uh, it makes sense uh, together, but you definitely don't know uh, which direction it's going to take. And that's partly because of like it's a base material. You know, it's like it's taking loosely from uh, Faust, obviously, but then also Fender the Opera, obviously, and then Picture of the Dorian Gray. So that's kind of like it's the bones of the structure. But then you add in all the rock and roll elements to it. And then De Palma's uh, amazing direction uh it's it just leads to a movie that i've uh, i've always loved and uh, yeah and i kind of like that he yeah. wrote, wrote this based on a bunch of different things i mean uh, at first glance this film is phantom of the opera right. uh phantom of the paradise obviously is right there in the title uh and it's you know um sort of this guy who gets disfigured but isn't you know a genius and kind of is in uh you know it's a sympathetic character to the audience because we know he's getting screwed over um yeah. but he has to hide be in the shadows so that um you know this monster is not seen and captured and he will stop at nothing for his art you know to be seen even though it's being stolen and ripped off um he needs to oversee it and make sure that like you said this character that he had uh seen performing his songs when he went to kind of confront the guy about it uh like what's going on with this uh why I mean, he didn't confront him at that point but he was kind of like wanting to see where things were is my music going to be in your opening of the paradise which is this club uh slash like stage i don't know exactly i don't even know what the paradise really is there's so much going on in that like it's like is it a music hall is it sort of like a um club i don't know it's like a it's a he's, he's trying to make a mecca for rock and roll yeah you know, a, a homeland basically for all things rock <laughs> but and let's just talk for a second um so this film opens up 
uh, we're, we're kind of getting uh, jumbling around here because there's a lot going on in this film. And what I was mentioning before is the Palma wrote this um, and based on, as you mentioned, a bunch of different things that uh, are really like a cool mix, you know, but I think because of that, that's why I kind of jumbles around a little bit. Like he has to throw in his little like uh, moments, the psycho like nods. And then also there's, a, I, I don't know if you caught this, but for me, there was like a lot of, like Citizen Kane kind of feel to this film as well. Like um, mm. sort of like uh, not stopping and making sure that this like main character is the person who like has like the triumph. And that's kind of what Kane was doing with like his last wife where he was built the rock opera house for her. Um, I mean, I'm not sure if I'm stretching too far on that, but at the same time, like I sure De Palma, like, you know, saw a little bit of Citizen Kane and um, threw it into this. But at the beginning of the film, our main character uh, who wrote these amazing songs, who goes on to do all of these things. It even opens up saying like he introduced jazz to New Orleans. Like he was just like this guy who really like, you know, made his mark and is a legendary musician. This guy now is um, we see it opening up as his first band, which is a band called the fruit bats. And they're performing this sort of like juicy fruits. Cookies. Yeah. Oh, the juice fruits. I'm sorry. The, 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 the fruit bats is an the fruit band. band. Yeah. That, that, they're yeah. a good band too. But the, the juicy fruits is the fifties nostalgia uh, rock band that they open up with. So. Yeah. And it's so good. Like it's so good. And so like, it's kind of like, yeah, this is like the first thing, uh, introduction to this, this genius writer who's on the piano in this uh, band. And you're like, wow, I'm immediately into the film as soon as like they start doing that. And of <laughs> course, like they're playing up like the, the doo-wop singers are the guys. It's almost kind of like Crybaby, you know, it's like yep, precursor yep. to Crybaby with like, you know, Wah! and like they're doing this <sighs> while they're singing. It's so good. They're fantastic. Like so, a little John Waters in there too, you know? Oh yeah, absolutely. So yeah, Swan is the uh, the head uh, person. He's, he's kind of based on like a Phil Spector character. He's played by Paul Williams, kind of a diminutive little guy. He's so good in this movie. He just he's so charismatic in a kind of a scummy way because he's basically the one who's uh, stealing uh, Winslow Leach's voice and who ends up becoming the Phantom. And then, as you said, mentioned, uh, the Juicy Fruits are his 50s rock nostalgia band, and it's played by, uh, so the three actors uh, that play in the three bands throughout, uh, I love so much the way that it's like set up like this. So it's Archie Han, Jeffrey Comanner, and Peter Ibling. So they basically play the three bands that you find throughout the movie. It's the Juicy Fruits at the beginning, uh, the Beach Bums, uh, which is kind of like a Beach Boys uh, rock uh, rock and roll band in the middle, and then the Undead, uh, which is basically a goth metal act near the end. So good. <laughs> and so it's these three actors. They they portray all three of these bands, and they're just kind of like the through line uh, whenever there's a uh, song playing. Uh, and it's it's so well done with that. Uh, Archie Han. Um, uh, it turns out, I mean, he shows up a lot in um, uh, a lot of uh, Joe Dante movies. You know, he had like a small little role in The Burbs and Gremlins too. So he was the main singer of the Juicy Fruits. So like when I put that together and realized who he was, it was fantastic. Um, yeah, we're, I, I was hoping that you would uh, uh, land positively on the Juicy Fruits because uh, that opening song uh, is uh, is an absolute banger and is one that uh, I've re I've been listening to the soundtrack all weekend. Like I text you because uh, the, the entire thing is so great. I know I felt bad as soon as like because I've uh, to everybody out there I've been busy so I, I pushed this off a little bit um, and I felt bad as soon as I watched the film. I'm like, oh, if I had watched this film and I was like told like or you told me you were gonna push this uh talk off i would be bummed too because i would be like jesus man these songs are so great i can't wait to talk <laughs> about them you know like it re they really are they're like the music is very good in it and uh the way the performances go like it makes you just like the songs even more yeah so paul williams uh the singer uh and playing swan he basically wrote as far as i understand he wrote pretty much every song uh, or at least uh, contributed to the uh, made, uh He definitely wrote every major song and contributed to all the extra ones. So he really is the musical force in this movie. Like him and De Palma are basically the two people most responsible for the tone and the sound of the movie. Um, and yeah, he's, he's not really somebody who was like on my radar too much outside of this movie. Um, I know he is a musician um, and he kind of shows up in movies randomly. 
there's this great uh, clip of him showing up and Johnny Carson still in costume after filming Battle for the Planet of the Apes. So he's actually performing music on Johnny Carson dressed up as an ape uh, from <laughs> filming that movie in the 70s. So Awesome. Yeah. And then I did, uh, so I have, I picked up the DVD a couple years ago. Uh, great cover. I love this. And yeah. it's got a couple great uh, features. And one of them is an interview with Paul Williams moderated by Guillermo del Toro. And oh, so wow. del Toro is a huge fan of this movie. Uh, Unsurprisingly. I mean. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, he actually recently posted a picture of, uh, I mean, if you know del Toro at all, his entire home is just a museum to uh, old horror uh, and, and uh, memorabilia. And he posted a picture of him with a life-size statue of the Phantom uh, cool. with, with Hideo Kojima, the creator of Metal Gear Solid. Um, and so, yeah, it was just coincidentally, it was great to see that. Uh, but yeah, was, he's got a great interview with Paul Williams, just talks about like the conception of his early life as an artist, what, how he got into the movies and stuff like that. And if you've ever seen Del Toro talk, you can know like when he's uh, talking about something he loves, his passion is definitely there for it. Mm, totally and you know actually it's funny somebody out here was just telling me they're like yeah i was just in a old um like kind of like one of those like off the beaten path movies uh movie like kind of uh vintage movie stores and they saw benicio de, or uh, guillermo del toro in the in the, the the just like browsing around in it. and i was like that's a huge sighting you know to see that great director looking at like movie memorabilia stuff you know oh, yeah. um yeah, I, I definitely think that uh, what a cool collaboration, you know, for um, De Palma to have somebody who's an actual musician who's in the film, but also wrote a lot of the music. Like, I think that's why this is such a it does connect so well, even though like at times you find yourself kind of it, the story moves really quickly. Like all of a sudden, you know, our lead character here is getting disfigured and getting um, in put in jail. And it all happens within like, you know. 15 minutes or something right. like, uh, and, and then all of a sudden he's the phantom and you're kind of like you blink and you miss the fact that he's like you know picked out all of the wardrobe stuff and like you know transitioned into this phantom thing um also like a really cool scene where you see him kind of like you know he's got these metal teeth because uh in the prison i don't know like by the way De Palma writing this is so funny like in the prison uh because of hygiene they want to like replace all the prisoners like teeth with uh like stainless steel so that there's a good hygiene so that's why like it kind of like you know he has this weird metal look when he smiles which is awesome it makes the like character look so cool um but it also adds to like the weirdness of when he's like performing in that little room that they put him in and again that little room and when they wall him up that was super edgar Allan poe like castle mm -hmm. montelado you know um which is another like kind of horror thing that I just think was so well, like secretly kind of folded into the whole story. Yeah. I uh, is it the one where he, when uh, Swan is like tuning uh, his voice box mm -hmm. to get the voice. Yeah. I love that because he basically tunes it to the Swan's own voice, which is basically, I mean, it's just like a straight up telling of what the story is. He's stealing Winslow's voice, the Phantom's voice, for his own uh, gain to open the paradise. And he's just, it shows him like doing all the, the, the switches and uh, producing it in the voice box. So he has a voice and he just tunes it to make it sound exactly like Paul Williams himself. So yeah. it's just like such a perfect touch to that, that it's, you can kind of miss it because it's not entirely clear, but. Uh, well, that's what, kind of what I'm saying. Like all of yeah. a sudden he's in there doing that and you're kind of like, well, there's just like all like happened within for the last 15 minutes. Right, 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 right. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, so he has him sign that contract, which is such a great uh, part when he's reading the contract. So he's this, at this point, he's as the Phantom, which he's got. If you if you've never seen the movie or if you haven't seen pictures, it's basically like a bird like owl, part metallic, part Darth Vader kind of costume. It's like such a unique, awesome looking costume that I'm sure a lot of people have like maybe seen images over the years even if you haven't seen the movie itself because it's so iconic and so he's having him sign that contract he's got that part when he's reading it it's like everything unto me will be delivered to you and he's like what does that mean and, and swan's just like oh that's a transportation clause <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's, it's just like, like it's, it's just like so, any of those things they're so hard to read so hard right, to understand right. yeah yeah it's delivered so perfectly by uh, paul williams i love it so he starts writing the cantata to open it uh and that's kind of when he rediscovers phoenix played by jessica harper of uh suspiria fame which mm -hmm. i um 
uh i haven't revisited superior in a while but uh like she definitely is uh kind of the queen of like two cult classics back to back from the 70s because like between this and that uh she's uh nailed and she does her she does her own singing in this and um yeah i mean she's so good and it's like such a great uh duo with this and and suspirio uh i also when i was reading the wikipedia uh it was kind of cool to see um the guy who did the the art for it because this this film is very um visual and i think uh it was like um gosh i can't remember his name i've got it. i gotta open the wikipedia now hold on you guys out there uh the person who did it was um oh geez gosh uh I can't find his name now, but uh, I was I was kind of cool because I went down a little rabbit hole of like, oh, the guy who did the the art for the poster also did like E.T. and a bunch of also uh, like bigger movies and was a very like well-known artist in his time. He passed away in 2008. Um, I'll, mm. I'll find his name as we're talking here. I don't want to take too much time out searching for it. But um, I also love that kind of stuff, you know, like these films all are like at a time where they have like a style they're like marketed in a certain way uh people are like gravitate towards something that they kind of it's familiar because of the artist's style but at the same time it's like totally unique because it's for this movie in general like whenever you go out there and you see like indiana jones like posters right you're like oh it's like that drawn kind of feel adventure and it's like damn like or, you know it's kind of like that with star wars too right like whenever something comes out you've got this like amazingly rendered poster and i always love like a really good theatrical poster so um yeah anyway that's my little sidebar about that i liked reading up on the guy who did it oh man i mean the art uh for movie posters back in the day it's definitely an, a lost art form in general because yeah right it's kind of movie... like having like saw bass do the titles you know it's like you knew who when when you saw those it was saw bass yeah and it was i i was i remember hearing somebody talk about this because it was back in the day a poster was oftentimes the only marketing tool uh that they had oftentimes right. that was the only thing somebody would see like passing it in a theater or something so it just had to be so much more interesting and engaging immediately whereas now it's like you know you, you have avengers endgame poster it's, it's just a photoshop thing because there's a thousand other uh uh marketing tools that uh, they're using for any big budget movie now I mean, yeah, for sure. I mean, I I still say that it's definitely, you know, important to see like what this film's going to like licorice pizza when that came out. It was like that was a drawn kind of poster feel kind of obviously harkening back to that time period. Um, but it was very instantly recognizable once upon a time in Hollywood, you know, these kind of like films that like, albeit those are two directors who get film, you know, right. exactly. and understand That's, it that way. Yeah. But, but yeah. also have the opportunity to kind of do that the way that they want to do it or right. against against the um uh industry norms yeah you're bringing somebody into the theater without having them ever see in the film you know and that's yeah. like the best part about these um because again i just like it kind of looks like uh what was the film that he did with uh uh inherent vice the, the the poster for this actually looks exactly like kind of the inherent vice style that happened uh and that, i think that was a 2017 film by paul tom mm. sanders said right yeah that's right i don't know i mean if you saw this just walking by right i'd be like i gotta see that movie <laughs> look at that i mean it's awesome sorry everybody who's not viewing this but like yeah. it is such a cool visual um uh, and that right. that uh that redesign of the phantom you know yeah. everybody yeah. knows what the phantom of the opera looks like from either the silent film or just like you know seeing that story replayed over time but like this is a really really new cool looking phantom of the opera oh, so fantastic uh so yeah phoenix she has that great song special to me absolutely love that uh just Harper actually singing that i'm pretty sure uh fantastic voice uh and this is when swan decides he doesn't want her to open the, with the music and so he brings in one of the best parts of the movie beef played by garrett graham so good. such such a great performance uh garrett graham to me as a child he was the stepfather in child's play child's play two um so kind of a stuffy role but like a uh, absolute classic and then uh playing opposite kurt russell in used cars um mm -hmm. 
Yeah, you've wow. seen used cars, right? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah I, so that, I, I just like right now putting the connection together. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, because it's this is such a uh I mean, it's the most flamboyant uh performance uh uh that I, one of uh, I've ever seen uh and Gary Cramp just absolutely I mean, can we just talk about that for a second? Yeah. The guy is definitely p- playing like a flamboyant and like, you know, there's a lot of like homosexual vibes in this film, I would say. Don't you don't you believe uh i mean yes and most of it's coming from beef for sure yeah, yeah well for yeah. sure but also like there's also like some kind of like blatantly like you this wouldn't happen in a movie today where like the guy uh winslow the lead character is like sitting there with a bunch of the girls and they're like the the producer comes out and says get this fag out of here you know what i'm talking with you know the scene right. i'm talking about oh yeah absolutely yeah he can, it was so winslow kind of dresses up as a girl to like get back into their uh the paradise to try to figure out like where what why is my music being taken away from me and yes yeah, swan just comes in drops that and it's it, it, it sets the tone for it for sure it's like really kind of shocking at least watching it in this day and age like that they just like blatantly went out and said that and right. then there's also kind of like a little bit of hatred for like hippies in this film i don't know if you've noticed that too like uh mm. especially when they're picking out the person who's going to like be the lead and they ended up picking beef like there's a bunch of people that kind of come with an acoustic guitar and they're like that's the election service is really also very well directed yeah, yeah. um it's, oh, it, the, it, with all the, the like the three yeah. or four different musicians and he was passing yeah uh i saw classic, in the- classic stuff there also yeah. de palma split screen coming in a lot in this film is awesome yeah well i mean this is glam rock uh this is what uh the 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 um the foundation of the rock uh, and roll for this movie is is glam rock this is 74 this is two years after lou reed's transformer uh it's certainly the uh questioning of like gender roles and especially in performance uh you got david bowie obviously uh producing transformer and exploding then I mean that's the foundation of it and so beef's performance just just completely fits into it and it's honestly one of the best parts of it so. i think academy award worthy by the way <clears throat> the performance of beef is like <laughs> one of my favorite favorite parts of this film yeah. so good especially when he comes out and it's like the way that De Palma sets up like his introduction to the audience who's about to see like him performing and you know sl- spoiler alert he dies um right before his death like fucking brilliance it's directed <laughs> so well it's acted so well uh he's so flamboyant so over the top and he's like doing this with his tongue like ah, yes. you know? and then it, then he ends up getting electrocuted all leading up to that moment where it's like then the editing is cut like so well it's it, it that is like superbly done yeah we're seeing this film for that little scene so he performs uh so there's an opening song with the undead uh the three uh guys from the beach bums and the um juicy fruits they end up doing the the goth metal band the undead they basically look like kiss uh possibly before kiss was a thing actually so they perform their song which is great um somebody super like you and then beef comes out uh to perform life at last basically as a frankenstein character coming up from the uh, up from the dead and it's such a fantastic performance and then yeah like you said near the end of it phantom throws the electro bolt and i saw a little clip from the editor and he talked about how he got he achieved that shot and so he spliced up the frames basically going forward but back one so like two one four three wow uh six five eight seven so that's how he cut up the uh the frames on the film and so that's why you have that really interest like you said like that that the the editing in it and the way he looks like when he's getting electrocuted it's like very jarring it's like I've, I've never seen uh anything like that I had me either and it's funny because yeah. not since either like you know I mean I think it, I would have thought everybody would have been stealing that you know because that's yeah, yeah. like such a brilliant uh scene um yeah so by the way i just wanted to say quickly john alvin is the name of the artist who did uh and he was just kind of killing it for a while doing all these uh theatrical posters for a lot of like some of the greatest movies that we've ever seen um that was like a fun little um find for me oh yeah yeah the name sounds familiar i'm seeing oh he did uh the aladdin poster fantastic i'm seeing one from uh the original alien right some disney stuff in there too yeah lion king legend absolute legend yeah, yeah like i said a lost art uh, needs more of those so 
Um, we did skip over the Beach Bums performance. What did you think of that? The, oh, when, yeah. I, I bet when the split screen happened, you were like, oh, thank you. Yeah, <laughs> it was brilliant. You know, it's funny because I just I just read that um, Ryan Wilson's uh, wife died yesterday. And, oh, sure. uh, you know, I love the Beach Boys. I'm just like such a big fan. I'm sure you are, too. And like uh, this is a very nice tribute like it was a 74 film so like you know the beach boys would have fallen off at least in popularity by then so this is just like if you could put yourself in that time period it's got to be like something really really kind of nice for the audience to kind of hear that again and yeah. uh, you know uh it, it's 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 a nice tribute i think yeah yeah i mean it, it flows perfectly with the three bands like you know you got the 50s with the juicy fruits the 60s with the beach bums and then the 70s with the undead what's your and, favorite incarnation of the band in this uh band? of their band with the oh god that's so hard fucking hard i mean I know, obviously right? my favorite is is goth metal but i know <laughs> i think in terms of the direction uh, in the movie it's the beach bums but then purely on the song it's the juicy fruits so it's like, I, I, I would agree with that one thousand percent that's exactly like, how i would have said it's it, just yeah. contextual of like whether the song the direction or the my general inclination towards metal uh so that's again it's, there's it, it's they're the through line you have the three bands and they just carry the whole film from one to the next to the other and that's why like again it's like you have the whole story going on and you never know where it's going to go and every scene is great and it works so well together so can I ask you, do you, do you know uh, the time period of I'm, I, I'm not like a huge Rocky Horror Picture fan. Uh, I, what was that before this film? I mean, they're very similar, I would think, as far as like the flamboyance, you know, very similar. Uh, this uh, Rocky Horror was after. OK, so, wow, this is like even before Rocky. And so obviously just Rocky, one year, Rocky, just one year. Wow. Yeah. They must have yeah. been like and then that was a huge hit, you know? <laughs> Yeah, I'm curious uh, how. In, I, ne I never know. Obviously, I mean, I've been to Rocky Horror like multiple times throughout my twenties, midnight showings, and it's always great. The music Box does a fantastic job. Their Shadow Cast. Um, I've never known uh, how big it was instantly, like whether or not it was like an instant hit, because it obviously grew. No, uh, uh, yeah, like a cult afterward. classic. You're, yeah. you're right. I, I don't really know the trajectory yeah. of that myself. But it was 75. And I mean, there is an alternate world where this, where Phantom of the Paradise became a cult classic and Rocky Horror uh, became a bomb. I mean, because like uh, in terms of quality um, and its uh, reflection of gender and just a uh, tribute to being rock and roll, um, I mean, it's in the contention with it. And just for whatever reason, Rocky Horror uh, became what it is. And this one is slowly, but still, you know, growing in appreciation, largely because of De Palma, though. So, yeah, I mean, yeah. it is, it, there's, I don't know a lot in terms of like what they were uh, in relation to each other uh, and influence, but uh, obviously pretty close uh, in production, though. So, yeah, and one year apart. I mean, that's crazy to, to know. Like, I was thinking about it the whole time. This film has such a Rocky Horror vibes to it. And uh, I know I've heard of Rocky Horror film, you know, that film a million times but i've never heard of phantom of paradise even as a huge de palma fan right. i wasn't really uh, this wasn't really on my radar you know it's yeah. crazy yeah i mean i i don't know why it uh uh wasn't uh what it was when it came out but obviously like i said in my experience with it uh it's got a rabid fan base you know people love this movie but again it's still not as mainstream as uh rocky or for sure though so you know that documentary that came out about De Palma, um, and I saw that you bought it on Blu-ray. You sent me a picture of it uh, the other day. For the audience out there, he's wow. holding up his Brian De Palma documentary right now on uh, Blu-ray that Pat, I think, picked up out of a bargain bin. This guy's finding the best finds out there in Chicago. <laughs> um, I, I remember watching it and loving it, but I can't recall if they touched on Phantom of Paradise in that. Um. Mm, I, it's been a couple of years since I watched it. I watched it right when it came out, uh, and I'm 99 percent sure they go, they go into it. Yeah, I mean he, they go into most every one of his movies, if if, if only briefly. So gotcha. and that's the thing because yeah. he has such a huge uh, filmography that it's it's to be honest, kind of easy unless you're you know devoting uh, complete attention to it. Uh, it's kind of easy to 
you know, pass over any directors, smaller films, uh, less than the, the ones that aren't as talked about, at least. Yeah, I think mostly from that documentary, I remember him just mostly like shitting on uh, Mission Impossible, <laughs> 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 which was awesome. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so anyway. Yeah, really quick, how yeah. is your Mission Impossible uh, marathon going? Have you have you made it past three? I think you gave up. Yeah, three. we're back. I, I think we got it to like four, <laughs> like, it, it, you know. Okay. Um, because what's yeah, tragic about that is six is the best one. So uh, if you, if if you were uh, if if you didn't feel like you wanted to watch all of them, I would have just said just watch six. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So. Well, I do want to, but you know, then other great shit comes out. Like far, yeah. we've been waiting for Fargo to come out, and Ooh. then we started watching that. You know, and all this other oh, yeah. uh, the 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 Nathan Fielder show. So we kind of like put things on the back burner and then don't, don't go back to them, you know, because yeah. again, I don't, I'm not like, I need to watch mission impossible, but we were so geeked out about it. Cause we were like, you know, that's Tom Cruise did his job and we were excited about the new film in theaters. And then the strike happened and then it wasn't really like that well received. And then, you know, it the, wasn't, the, yeah, it wasn't that great went away. Yeah. It, it, it wasn't was, that great. It there. I mean, it was still good. Uh, it's certainly not as good as five, four, five or six. Four, five, and six are still the best three of the whole tri- of all the movies. And so there I was saw something. The one. There was something. It was a movie that I could tell that it was being shot during lockdown because there was a disproportionate amount of um, scenes with just one person in it, and mm. uh, it, you could you could you could just tell like it was just a casualty, you know, like it's uh, out of anybody's control. But you could tell that they were filming in a way where they couldn't have a lot of people on set. Mm. Uh, yeah, it was just kind of interesting watching that. So interesting. Yeah. Um, I know that was like the movie during lockdown because of the fact that Tom Cruise got a uh, hot mic uh, on blasting people for not wearing their masks and stuff, which I thought right. was kind of kick ass, by the way, that tirade. Um, he was, <laughs> you know, which made it even cooler to want to watch it because you're like, this guy really gives a fuck, you know, he really wants people to like be working out there and, you know, like that he wants to get through this time and he's trying to lead the charge, but, um, but also anyway. kind of being like, yeah, I, I understand that everybody else can't work, but since I'm Tom Cruise, I can still make this movie as long as you wear your mask. So <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah, totally. it was crazy. Um, it's also fun to kind of revisit those over time. Like I love going back to the Christian Bale tirade every once in a while, you know, like, Oh, you're, you're done professionally you know oh you know like just like oh that kind good of shit. for you <laughs> pretty good <laughs> yeah those are fun um well anyway like you know again da palma is uh kind of a rogue badass doesn't give a fuck and um i don't know what's the last film you've seen of his we talked about this before i think my last one was um i saw the black dahlia oh you mean new movie uh, yeah um yeah, that's a good. Not that Black Dahlia is super new, but like that's the more no. most recent one I believe that I've seen of him because he hasn't made a ton of movies. Uh, I did see Black Dahlia when that first came out. I don't remember it at all, and I barely uh, appreciated that it was him. Uh, Mission to Mars, twenty three years ago now. I saw that in theaters. Snake Eyes. I'm just oh, going, yeah. I'm just going to cover that at some this. point. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, Snake Eyes is is fucking great. I mean, I remember seeing that purely because of Nicolas Cage, like going to see it for that. And I do, that does, that movie is worth it for the first 15 minutes. Cause it's got like this 10 to 15 minute single like take. tracking shot. Yeah. Yeah. It's a single shot. take. It's yeah. super fucking long. Um, and it's worth it just to see that uh, part of it. But yeah. Have you seen, I, I haven't seen it. Um, Femme Fatale from 2002. With, I did, but I can't, I can't, it's just like your thought of um, Black Dahlia. I remember. can't recall it. Yeah. I was I came across somebody's list. Uh, they were ranking uh, to Palma and they put it at two, I think. And uh, they just they made it sound really like a, a underrated gem of his. Um, Re- Rebecca Romaine Stamos, uh, yeah. Antonio Banderas. Yeah. So I definitely still need to see that one um, because, uh, like I said, there are some people who really hold that one high up that uh, I wasn't really much on my radar. So again, like, I mean, that's the thing with him is like, he's just made so much that like even great ones like this, you know, they just kind of fall under it because of, uh, for whatever reason. Yeah, totally. Um, so what is happening? So Swan has, um, he relegates, um, Phoenix to the backup singer beef, uh, takes it on stage and then, uh, 
Winslow, the phantom, he discovers that he can't kill himself because he's tied to blood with Swan. And so this leads to this whole uh, hilarious part, just showing um, Swan as a young man, basically selling his soul. And it leads to his marriage on stage with Phoenix. And super, uh, super confusing moment of the film, by the way. I, I mean, it's 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 kind of abstract. It's basically saying that Swan sold his soul, uh, which is like, if you can't be young forever, I don't want to live. That was his quote when basically he's, you know, he, it's his Faustian bargain uh, is that he wants his uh, to be a rock god, uh, Phil Spector, kind of uh, mecca uh, god, and uh, he's going to sell his own soul to do it. Um, the reaction shot of Winslow, by the way, watching that is incredible. It's like jaws on like the floor. He's like, but also just <laughs> they, it's so great that he only has the one eye because he's got his right side of the face burned. And so it's blacked out the eye and the mask. But then you see his, yeah, it's his like left super eye, wide open. His left eye is always just completely wide open. And it's such a great, uh, uh, I missed out by sending you the text uh, for that, uh, for this charming man, which I usually do to Darren. Before yeah, any, that's right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. that would have been good. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was going to say, there is that scene too, then where you're talking about, so Winslow as the phantom is, you know, wanting to kill himself, just like had enough and, and just can't, as you said, because of this um, sort of blood pact that uh, Swan does. And they're 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 combined together, but he also has to like watch uh, Phoenix through like a sunroof or whatever it is in the rain. Yep. Having set and there's this weird sort of again Hitchcock moment, kind of like the unspoken like Anthony Perkins is like masturbating through the people. Mm. Um, I believe in the in the novel uh, they talk about that more in in the birds. Or, I'm sorry, in Psycho. Um, and it's kind of just implied in Psycho. And I believe that's kind of what's happening here. It's like mm. almost like self masochistic, like, uh, like he's like watching it, but also getting like sexual pleasure out of watching them. Did you get that? Um, no, but I'm not very smart. So I'm not very <laughs> I'm subtle. I'm not trying to be the one who stretches <laughs> and trying to find a ton yeah, yeah. out of this. Like I, we got blasted online for our uh, Trash Humpers uh, episode where everybody's like, oh, you didn't get like the meaning out of Trash Humpers? I was like, no, uh, no, I didn't. <laughs> you know, fuck you. You know, it's like, yeah, come yeah. on, dude. Like, you know, I, I'm sure there's some sort of deeper meaning. But at this point, like, I'm not going to go digging for it. You know, like I, I enjoyed watching somebody put uh, dish soap on their pancakes and, uh, you know, the nude body that um you know you got to see somebody's ass for like five minutes uh while they pass them by and all of the cursing and all the weirdness i enjoyed it all uh but i'm not going to be looking for some deeper meaning in that so you know troll away online at us <laughs> if you want well but, yeah. i mean i've never claimed to be a person to be able to figure it out on myself people think i'm smart but i'm not so you know i've, yeah. I've always made sure that that's uh, uh, uh number one priority with the people with think the you're audience. smart just because you do a podcast you know <laughs> that's waning um no yeah i didn't it makes sense in hindsight especially you know, kind of like with with the psycho uh component uh where it was implied i didn't get it until i saw vince vaughn actually masturbate in the remake right well uh, right exactly yeah and, and so and if, of course if, in the gut somebody Sam one, yeah. if somebody remade phantom of paradise uh he would be jerking you know, vince vaughn would be jerking off on the roof <laughs> for sure and yeah. you'd see full frontal of it so um no, I mean, it definitely makes sense. You know, you, uh, you jerk off and then you try to kill yourself. Uh, you can't do it. Um, and so, yeah, it leads to the wedding. <laughs> the mask, I, I found out the mask was actually the mask uh, that, that Swan was wearing because his face is all burned now because his he loses his uh, vitality it's actually the mask that he used in a battle for the planet of the apes and so that's why it kind of it just looked so familiar because i remember seeing that as a young kid and uh he's kind of got almost a simian kind of vibe to it anyway i think that was probably why he was cast in the movie so that has very much uh that those moments and uh it, it really feels like house of wax as well uh, yeah. yeah i don't know if you have That's seen awesome. those originals there's three yeah. versions of it so I, whenever i talk about that people are like oh you mean the one with paris hilton and i'm like yeah i like that one but no that's not the one i'm talking about oh you my know? god i did see that one too i saw that one in theaters i haven't thought 2005, about 2005 dude yeah i haven't thought about it since then i should revisit 
<laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's fun around Halloween time because I love House of Wax yeah. and the original, which is really like uh, like a three color process or something weird like that. It was a really shitty DVD that I had for a long time. And then they restored it, but it was a Michael Curtiz film, which, uh, mm. of fa- you know, Casablanca fame. Mm. Um, and I always thought that was so just, like fun, like, damn. And it's, and because of this color process I'm talking about as it adds to the creepiness, but then I think it was in the fifties or something. Um, they redid it with, uh, Vincent Price, and that's an awesome version. And then again, I even liked the, the Paris Hilton version that they redid in 2005. So I've definitely seen the Vincent Price one. I haven't seen the earlier one. <laughs> Yeah. 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 Criterion has it pretty much, I think, on there now. I don't I don't think they usually get rid of it. So if you want to creep into my criterion. I, I do that on a regular basis. Yeah. <laughs> uh don't tell anybody who said that. Was, no, no, no. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Not I'm like buying. I watched this film on your Amazon account last night or anything. We'll just keep on going that I, I do pay for Criterion. This is another pickup this week. I finally picked up the Irishman Criterion. Ooh, yeah, nice. I, it's been holding this off. I don't know why I didn't buy this earlier, but for whatever reason, I finally picked it up. I absolutely love this movie. It's a beautiful Criterion case. I love the drawing on the front with the uh, with the ring. Just very excited for it. Speaking of Criterion, so yeah, I mean, again, like we pay for movies all over the place. <laughs> yeah. um, so to do this podcast uh, every once in a while, if the movie isn't available, Pat will creep into my uh, Criterion, but then go out and buy The Irishman, which I'm sure cost him forty five dollars. Oh. Worth every penny. Um, all right. Phantom of the Paradise. Anything I left out? Any other things you loved? I mean, you, so you really quickly mentioned beef in the shower and the psycho scene. Uh, I love that he's he uses the knife, but then left hand pulls out the plunger. It's kind of a one-two punch instead of the knife into beef. Such a good scene. <laughs> um, yeah. And again, I love playing on that. You know, it's always fun when people are like, it's almost like the original scary movies, you know, like. Yeah when they like just made fun of all of the uh, horror movies. Speaking of like, there's like Blair Witch was on Criterion and it got released um, on, at least on the streaming version. And I was like, man, I got to revisit that film, you know, because it became such like so popular and it became such a farce. I'm like, can I even watch this film as like a regular horror movie now? Like and understand it like in a way that isn't like pop culture, you know, still scary yeah. movies and stuff like that. Oh, I revisited Blair Witch a year or two ago, I was staying in a cabin uh, oh, up shit. north, and it was like I was like uh, it was a perfect time to watch it. It was fantastic, and it definitely. You know what's up, not a perfect time to watch is the strangers during that time. <laughs> fuck that dude fuck that yeah that is one that uh, a lot of people always kind of pull out as one of their actual scariest ones because it's so uh real I, like it yeah real yeah you're vulnerable I I, you're out in yeah. the middle of nowhere and there's these yeah. psychos that come to see yeah i mean it's that's that's truly frightening you can watch the blob and have fun but then if you watch the strangers you're like oh shit this might actually happen to me so <laughs> yeah exactly. uh but uh blair witch definitely holds up it was it was fantastic to see that again yeah totally i'm gonna gonna revisit it when i have a little time but um yeah i think i mean again i i passed over this film a bunch of times in my criterion and then it went away and i was like oh my god pat wants to watch this like uh, i didn't realize like it was worthy of uh, a discussion i did know it was De palma but for some reason i just wasn't interested and uh yeah like totally glad we watched it i really loved it now like i have a feeling this will be on my list every halloween to just like have some fun <laughs> and like you know um pull up some popcorn and enjoy the songs and i hope uh and i i, I we have a on spotify a remainders jukebox i hope we add that that a uh, juicy fruit song oh i think it. we should definitely yeah. yeah i mean the entire soundtrack is on uh is available everywhere including spotify and like i said i've been releasing to do it uh for the last week or so and it's just like uh, that's that's one reason why this movie will continue to grow it's just like the music kind of keeps it tied and when you revisit the soundtrack you realize how great it is yeah Love so it. awesome film if you're out there listening or if you're watching us uh thanks for listening to our review um by the way do we know what siskel and ebert said about this film uh i don't i didn't come across ebert i saw siskel gave it two stars but pauline kale did like it quite a bit really yeah damn okay I yeah well i look i'm giving it uh if I have two thumbs, which I do two thumbs up. Um, and, uh, that's a nice segue into Pat. 
for Christmas bought me a great book called Opposable Thumbs. Oh, hell yeah. And um, man, I almost kind of wish we would go back. Maybe we should do like one episode on that book. You know, maybe we shouldn't talk about it too much. That'd be fun to kind of, I, I re-listened to our Warren Zevon one the other day. Uh, we we covered Nothing's Bad Luck for all you Zevon fans out there. Pat and I are big fans. And man, it was really good. Like I heavily edited that one to pick out all of our ums and I added music to it. Like I spent a lot of time on some of our early episodes because like, you know, I heard somebody say the other day, it's like, okay, if you've got like, you know, 15 to a hundred people listening, like, you know, what's the return on investment if you're going to like cut out all the ands or bums, ums or whatever. It's like, you know, as a person who's really busy, do I want to spend two days doing that? Um, but when we first started this podcast, you know, instead of it being more just jive talking, you know, off the cuff, kind of whatever, uh, we we kind of, at least me, I, I'm this like control freak and I wanted everything to be perfect. So when I listened to that back, I hadn't listened to it. And man, we were like really killing it with that episode. We went like chapter by chapter. Oh, yeah. um, and then so the cool thing about that is because like how you do anything is how you do everything. All these years later, we did have a comment from CM Cushions, the, the the author of the of the fucking book. And yep. dude, I'm telling you, it like made my whole day, like uh, made my whole year so far. Like to see that the author of that great book was like into what we had to say about his art. And I really was so glad that we, I took the time to like, you know, put a little extra oomph into that episode. Cause when he listened to it, I was like, damn, like if I knew we were just like talking about something stupid, like, uh, you know, the phantom, uh, uh, pleasuring himself or something, I would be like kind of embarrassed, but, uh, you know, it was a really good episode pretty deep. Um, and yeah, if you haven't listened to that episode, it's available online everywhere. Uh, pretty early on. I think it was like number eight or number nine of, in our podcast that we did. Hell yeah. Shout out. Much appreciated to CM Cushions for checking uh, our podcast out. Because, yeah, I mean, we definitely, I mean, we obviously love Zevon, but that book was really, really well written. Uh, and as somebody who's followed Zevon for years, it was uh, a very uh, great tribute to him. At and the a, time, great, I remember, a great introduction to him, too, if, you, if you're not too familiar with him. So. Right. And at the time, I remember you saying it's like kind of like looked at as like the definitive book about Zevon. And it really yeah, is. I it's, it's, so. it's, I don't think there's going to be another one that's going to beat it. Um, he mentioned in his comment to us that he uh, has a bunch of other uh, books coming out. So I don't know if you look at uh, the comments online. Obviously, lately we've been getting a lot of shit, um, but uh, that was a good one. Who are we, we getting shit from? You, you gave me one uh, you about know, internet trash trolls. Some okay. people that don't even like listen to the podcast, probably they just like you know. <laughs> well, that's why you like your beard. That's why you don't listen to the comments. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's all good. I mean, hey, the good with the bad. And if anybody is commenting, that means they're paying attention. And hey, that's all we care about. I don't care. Like, I'm glad to do this podcast and we have our own opinions, just like anybody else. Getting back to the Ebert, uh, the Opposable Thumbs book that you bought me. I'm about halfway through now. Oh. And man, it's so good. Uh, you know, I, I, I never like love too much of the of the backstory stuff about how they grew up and stuff and like the nice thing is they don't touch on that too much it kind of goes and starts right into where they have this partnership that they're going to get mm -hmm. underway with and uh what i that's what i like about this book so far most is because like that's what i want to know about you know i yeah. want to know about how it worked what was the and it's a lot more about like how the tv dealings had to go back then and them looking out for themselves and like their deals that they made when they left wttw um how it would even be successful. And like the more and more I read stuff like that or watch everything, it's like, you know, being a character you're in your own right and just like having something to say and like having those things that piss off people on the internet is like a good thing, you know, yeah. like you just should be an individual, like have your own th and don't try to please everybody. And uh, Siskel and Ebert certainly didn't. This is the one book that I've read. It's called Opposable Thumbs. And it's the one book that I've read where I'm like, laughing out loud at some of the shit that I forgot that these guys did to each other. Like they just played <laughs> pranks on each other all the time. Uh, have you, have you finished it yet or? Uh, no, I haven't even started it. I've been uh, tearing through uh, uh, my struggle uh, from Carl of Nosgaard. It's a six book memoir. Uh, and then my also, God. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a big, like, he's a Norwegian writer. It's kind of uh, existential writing. Uh, so that one's taken up a lot of time, uh, but I have it right over here. 
Uh, but yeah, I mean, I'm down with uh, doing a conversation. I could definitely tear through that in a couple of days if I uh, just do uh, commit to that one. Yeah, I mean, I'm just sure. looking for. I'm just, I'm just kind of setting myself up for it because I'm very excited to read it. Um, because yeah, like you said, like I'm excited to learn more about the two of them together. Because uh, we, ta- I mean, we talked about the Life Itself episode, the the book, and that documentary. It's like those are both fantastic to learn about Ebert as himself. But then, like, I'm, like, really looking forward to this book, uh, just purely diving into their relationship and uh, their friendship. So, yeah, I, I was last uh, I was reading it outside on my little porch that I have here. And um, a neighbor came by and she's like, what are you reading? You know, and I was like, oh, it's a book on Siskel and Ebert. And then, like, I had to explain who Siskel and Ebert was to her. And, it, it's you know, it's not her fault that, like, she wouldn't know she's um you know, maybe just like not as tuned into, uh, you know, films the way that we are and can criticism. It's not like everybody would know, but I just kind of thought like maybe we're getting to the point where like people are forgetting a little bit about mm-hmm. like Siskel and Ebert. And to me, to get to you and me, two guys from Chicago, it was even more, it was like how Michael Jordan was, you know, because right. you just like, that's your hero. He's from your era. Um, he's from your town and you just know everything about him. But Siskel and Ebert were like, massive i mean you know movies would bomb if they didn't like say they liked it you know i mean this is <laughs> Which, this is not rotten tomatoes yeah. this is like right you know. yeah. yeah i mean that the, the influence they have is undoubtable uh but yeah but also i don't know like yeah I just criticism in general uh people view it differently now than they did before because it's become so democratized so like people are just much more wary to be like well, this person said this movie's good or bad, uh, which is kind of the rise of Rotten Tomatoes, which is also a shit way to uh, rate movies anyway. So, but I mean, we long, all do my, it. We all look at of, stuff, you know. How many yeah, thumbs sure. ups does it have? How many likes does it have? You know, it's like okay, for sure. well, if it doesn't have a lot. It must not be good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just think it's people are process it more like like everything else, where it's just like you know they don't take it uh, too seriously. So, but yeah, yeah. I mean, that, like you're saying, like us growing up in Chicago, I've always wondered about that. It's like how much do we follow Cisco Labor because they were in our hometown uh, as right. opposed to if, if you were growing up in LA or something. Right. Cause like, you know, I, I leave the book out sometimes and I come in and get a drink of water. People are probably passing by in my apartment complex here and looking at it and be like, who the fuck are these guys? You know, like <laughs> right on the cover, it's got them in the, in the movie theater, which is a, a great cover. Wow. Um, yeah. I, we love Cisco and Ebert. Uh, the, There's this great book is great. Uh, there's this YouTube channel, I forget the name, but I've been following recently. They've been editing together, uh, all the Siskel and Ebert reviews by director. So like every James Cameron movie, oh, every wow. Joe Dante movie. So I've been kind of just enjoying those every once in a while. Cause it's a wow. awesome way to, to go throughout the years and see how they view the director, uh, in, in the context of their own work. Is there a lot of their, uh, old shows out there on YouTube? I guess they are. Huh? Tons. Yeah. P- people. You, there's so many tribute uh, um, channels to Cisco and Ebert, so you can you can find most every old school review. Uh, maybe not necessarily as a single piece, but like a, as part of an episode that would have aired in like the 80s or 90s. Okay, can I tell a quick story? Please do. Okay, for all you guys out there, um, this is um, something. If you lived in Chicago and around the time of Cisco and Ebert reviewing films, I would think that seeing Siskel or Ebert in the theater viewing something while you were viewing a film would be like probably the coolest fucking thing that could ever happen to you. Um, and over the weekend, I saw my girlfriend that I was reading this book and, you know, giving her a little synopsis on certain things. And she's like, you know, I was at a theater seeing hard candy and I walk in and in the back is Roger Ebert with like, you know, ready to watch hard candy. She's like, it was only like five of us in the theater about to watch it. And I was like, wow, like, like, were you freaking out? She's like, well, you know, like, yeah, it was awesome. But like, you know, I didn't really think about it. And then like, I thought later on, like, holy shit, I just watched a movie and Roger Ebert was there like, and he's going to write a review of it. And I was like, did you ever read the review? And she's like, no, I never, I never have. So we went through and we read the review uh, over the weekend together. And she was like, wow, like she was like blown away. Like, wow, like this is like his thoughts from being in the theater watching this film at the same time that I was. And then she, then she kind of gave her thoughts on the film. And it was such a cool way 
to like connect, you know? Uh, and I really loved that story. Like I don't, I was not lucky enough to like be in a theater and see either of those oh, great critics, you know, I don't crazy. think you, you were either, but no, no, no. Yeah. Uh, yeah, which I'm sorry. Did you mention which theater? Um, I know the theater she talked about, but I can't like place the name offhand. Uh, it, I asked her uh, what the name was, and then she told me. But um, it's right next to the Cisco <laughs> Center. I just can't remember the name. Uh, right next to the Cisco Center. Pretty close. She said like a block In over state? or something like that. Uh well, River East is there. That's been there. Well, for it's a, a while, it was so. a screen. It was a screening room. So she went there from like oh. some company she was working for. Okay. Yeah. Nice. So Hard Candy is that the that the Patrick Wilson? Um, and I never saw the film. Um, Elliot, it, Elliot but Page? it is Elliot uh, Elliot Page's yeah. uh, first film. Yeah. Yeah, I saw that shortly after it came out, and that's stuck with me ever since because that is a fucked up movie. <laughs> like, yeah. I, so I that's like that. the thing. She's like, I'm seeing this movie. Yeah. with Roger Ebert. Yeah. <laughs> that's yeah, that movie is stuck with me. That's a wild wild fucking movie. Um that's awesome. I love cool that. Cool story though, right? Yeah, that's that's so fantastic. She's definitely got it uh speed over that between the two of us uh, never we never well, got mean, to enjoy movie. Bragging movie. rights for sure. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, absolutely. It's like she'll watch you, she sees you reading the book. It's like, "Eh, I lived that." So. Yeah, I've been there. Yeah, I've been there done that. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, that that's uh my last weekend. It was fun going through that and reading. You know, even for anybody out there if you had watched life itself and we talked about this in our episode which was episode number one of remainders you can go by uh buy and check out rogerebert.com and read any review that he had done and new reviews that uh you know there's a bunch of people on staff for that what i liked most about um what he was doing at, towards the end of his life was he was really cultivating his life's work and making sure that it would be always available for the public to be you know accessible to the public and that's what's so great you can go to rogerebert.com and you can read any review he ever did uh, including his three and a half star review of anaconda which i always like to bring up so yeah the or his review classic. of uh uh the brown bunny <laughs> that he famously <laughs> just like totally totally housed uh vincent gallo in so i uh, one more thing on roger ebert i picked up finally dark city on dvd um which I don't know if you ever saw. It's the Alex Proyas. It's like 1998. Uh, he's, he was the guy who directed The Crow. Uh, it's kind of like a old school um, gothic noir, but like kind of set in the future. And Roger Ebert loved the movie so much that he did a commentary for it, for the movie. So like oh. on the DVD, there's a commentary with Roger Ebert talking about the movie, which is not... I don't. I don't think I've ever seen any him ever do that. Uh, Casablanca. Any other movie. He did. did he do it for? Okay, nice. Yeah. But obviously, if he did it for Dark City and Casablanca, it shows how much he loved Dark City. So uh, I picked that up recently. Looking forward because I, I remember that back in the day, like seeing that at Suncoast. You're like Roger Ebert did a commentary for this movie. I need to check this out. But I never. Oh wow. Uh, hmm. Got to the commentary itself. The movie is great. Uh, so yeah, I'm looking forward to listening to that uh, to hear to hear his thoughts on it. Cool um yeah so i don't know uh anything else going on are we uh wrapping up this conversation here i mean we've already talked about phantom of paradise uh let's wrap up phantom of the paradise highly recommended absolutely love this movie uh check it out that's my awesome. thoughts so <laughs> all right awesome took us uh, an hour and a half to get to that check it out <laughs> well uh, you know we always do the uh offshoots and that's fine as we should uh that's the best part um yeah not much else i mean it's been a pretty chill january just catching up uh with some reading i've been watching all the alien and predator movies for fun uh just because that's that's my jam and i did uh check out godzilla again, in black and white yeah in black and white which is fucking fantastic uh oscar nominated now first oscar uh that the entire franchise has ever received even though it's just for special effects but it's good that this is becoming kind of one of the most i think it just became like the second highest grossing foreign film in u.s history so kick ass man um, what was that yeah. first uh crouching tiger hidden dragon that probably is it i didn't see first i saw that it passed uh now i don't remember yeah so yeah well i haven't seen it yet uh my nephew is a huge fan and he is out here um doing his residency i think i told you he was coming out and so like he would told me the other day it's like i'm going to see god's and i couldn't go 
you because you saw it in black and white as well and he was like yeah man it almost felt like more old school monster movie that way totally i mean i'm a proponent of black and white for any pictures i mean i think most movies look better in black and white uh but i'm a little biased with that but yeah it's definitely uh especially great when the monster movies do it you got you like the mist i know they have a black and white version uh mad max fury road has an awesome black and white version it's just it is uh, a pure way to enjoy a movie uh especially like throwback genres like that and it works so well with it i mean this is as good if not better than the original godzilla from the 1950s um and so having it in black and white just like that film just makes total sense yeah uh you are a big fan of the thing and i'm watching Absolutely. the new true detective i saw and... there was a little tribute to that it's jody foster right a little tribute. Uh, oh, I, I mean, I just all I saw was a screenshot, and it was like, oh yeah, they got to be referencing the thing for sure. So okay, so <laughs> you're like a little tribute, no, way more. Um, than that. <laughs> well, like I, I haven't seen gonna, it. So, yeah. I, I'm trying to figure out what to say because I right, haven't right. seen it, and I know nobody out there who's listening still this new, far yeah, has so. seen it uh, yeah. or may have seen it, and they want to talk about it, but it's not over yet. Like I think only three episodes have aired thus far. Uh, really liking it so far. I was never oh, yeah. like oh jodie foster like obviously she's great you know love silence of the lambs love panic room you know different things that she's done but like seeing her again is kind of really nice um she's really good as this character a lot of really well written characters <coughs> excuse me um setting in like alaska during the time when uh <clears throat> it's like constantly night uh kind of like insomnia i'm trying to explain insomnia to my girlfriend the other day like somehow under the radar christopher nolan film for a lot of people uh but yeah it has that vibe and then also this like supernatural vibe to it uh and there's these like scientists out there a la the thing mm -hmm. uh so you don't know too much yet it's still early but like it's a very like the vi the thing vibes are super super heavy i saw like a a shot of them outside at night in the snow and there was like a pile of bodies which is i mean that's i'm not giving anything away with that i haven't seen it myself but i was like no yeah, it's fucking awesome man that's i mean there was like this so. moment that opened i think episode two with that that you're talking about mm. uh it was like super horror kind of vibes and uh my girlfriend like basically texted me when she saw that she's like oh my god you're gonna fucking love this episode because she knew <laughs> like as soon as whatever happened uh that i would be like into it so i'm really liking it you know like the the third or second true detective that you know kind of got a bad rap but like what could follow really the mcconaughey version and I, but i've liked them all you know and this one this is really like kind of my fam favorite since the first season the second one was the vince vaughn yeah yeah um yeah. yeah so i've been watching We'll stay on the theme for a second. Uh, I was thinking the other day, uh, the trajectory of that movie is pretty insane because that movie was not liked when it first came out, critically hated and bombed at the box office. And then like when we were kids, we saw it on like sci-fi. And by the time we were working at Suncoast, it was like a very well-respected horror movie, but still not mainstream. And then- Are we talking about like, the remake? We're talking about John Carp Carpenter's yeah, version. Yeah, yeah, okay, for yeah. sure, absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, the 50s one is good, but yeah, yeah, we're, we're definitely talking carpenters. Um, so when we were at Suncoast, um, it was a well respected horror movie, but still not really mainstream. And then fast forward now, like another 20 years, and it's like it legit is like mainstream viewed as like one of the better movies of the 20th century. Yeah, and just seeing that that trajectory over my life has been like uh, amazing to watch because like it's just showing like what time and art can do to each other it's just like mm -hmm. what when something actually takes time to um uh be well received by critic or just by uh, other audience in general it's been pretty amazing and just watching that just go from zero to a hundred over the course of uh uh many decades has been amazing and i was just like rightfully yeah. so rightfully viewed as like one of the better films of all time yeah totally well um i think i don't you know you would love it i know you're not like super into getting into like binge tv shows um you know i watched a couple not, episodes but... of the curse uh, okay i started the curse um absolutely loving it and the yeah. most interesting tv i've seen in i know years like, i know even uh i saw that nolan shouted out he's like this is going yeah. back to like twin peaks as being like 
yeah. uh, innovative TV in a way that you just rarely ever get. So I'm looking forward to continuing that. Yeah, there's a lot, lot to talk about there, but uh, I loved it. I, was, and, uh, I mean, I cannot believe how awkward and cringe that show was. And then, like, I mean, even like ten minutes in, I'm like, oh, this is a, this is a show that's just needling you with cringe scenes because that opening scene when he's trying to get the the woman to like fake cry because uh they're giving her a little money for her uh cancer so that she's not kicked out of her uh home i was like this is a ballsy ass way to start a show yeah and there's so much like to talk about too with like people who work within reality tv like my girlfriend being one of them um that is uh it's it's it's, 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 you know yeah you, you don't think that shit happens i mean you know <laughs> <laughs> so anyway i'm glad you're watching uh, it that's great yeah yeah i'm definitely looking forward to continuing it so cool. um anything you watch i heard you caught up with uh a little auteur uh called scorsese and his latest film yeah yeah up and coming director martin yeah. scorsese uh yeah dude i remember when i had heard from you and even my uh, friend Tom, you know, the two people I re- love and respect about films were like, uh, yeah, the movie is great, but uh, you know, it's long. And, um, I don't, I think, think it's when it wanna... needs, it needs time to marinate. Yeah. Well, and needs time to marinate or, you know, I'm not w- wanting to go back and watch that. And it, cause it's, cause you know, it's heavy, um, as far as the subject matter, but I didn't find it to be any of those things. I like, loved loved it on first watch really big fan um and i can see what you guys are saying for sure you know yeah uh, and i didn't see it in the theater i saw it from the comfort of my own bed where you could press pause and you know yeah. use the washroom if you needed to but um yeah scorsese just what like how how like it's like it bums me out almost that like people are so good at what they do like martin scorsese it's like you know i don't know if you watch any of those featurettes online of him like directing and stuff like that and it's just like so interesting um i know you know dicaprio produced that too and just seeing like his level of involvement is so cool um what a great film and please martin scorsese live to be Fifty thousand years, because like we need people make like him making films, you know. Right, right. Um, yeah, no, I'm about ready for a rewatch the second time. Yeah, I, I meant to watch it again, but yeah, I only saw it the one time in the theater. Um, and to be clear, I did love it. Yeah, it's uh, no, I know, I know, it's an I didn't say that. Yeah, masterpiece. But it is one that I felt like, all right, I'm going to take a minute and not instantly rewatch this because it is a uh, heavy lift and. Um, I think again, like all of his movies, I mean, I don't think there's any movie that doesn't get better with age that he's made. I guess, yeah, I guess like the shocking thing for me is like for people who had seen it um, and I hadn't, like I was expecting like, especially you or Tom, because I know you guys love Scorsese, you guys love film to be like, oh dude, it's the fucking best movie I've ever seen, you know? Um, And it was kind kind of like the reaction was like different than what I was expecting. Not that that's a bad thing. It was like, you love the film, but you were just like, there's a lot here, you know? yeah because it's not it isn't flashy like uh i think that's kind of the case with the irishman too like i was i love that one i certainly think it's top five for scorsese now after a couple of rewatches over the last couple of years that's how much i love irishman uh now uh because that one isn't flashy like goodfellas or casino or whatnot is sometimes you may be perceived to like watch a few of his movies and so it takes a, a couple times uh to kind of really pick up on everything because yeah like it's almost four hours there's a lot of nuance there and for a dummy like me to try to get that all on the first watch not going to happen so um and like the level of detail i don't even need to talk about this because everybody knows you know that scorsese is like amazing with that except for continuity you know he's a classic continuity era guy um but but he always says it's because it's, it's about the performances than it is about like worrying if the guy's cigarette is half smoked or not um yeah goodfellas is like a chock full of that stuff <laughs> however um there was one thing that i just loved and i'm just going to share it with the audience here uh and you pat um I watch movies uh, when I watch them with my girlfriend with subtitles on because she's right by a big um, roadway and it's like impossible to hear anything. And then, of course, like it's usually late and you don't want to put your you know speakers up like super loud. And I'm super deaf from playing music my whole life. Um, so 
you know, I'm watching it with subtitles and like a lot of time when you're hearing the native tongue uh, in this film, you are like, there's no subtitles for it. Mm -hmm. And later I watched one of the vignettes and I saw Scorsese saying, you know, we decided to, you know, when you were wa watching that the subtitles wouldn't be on it. Cause you just understand because of how good the actors are mm -hmm. and because of like what's happening in the scene that you understand what they're saying without having to know the language. And I thought, damn, like even that's like, a just like something he's thinking about, like, whether or not the audience gets to read what they're saying, you know? Yeah. Oh, that's incredible. Yeah. I haven't really, I haven't watched too much stuff about the making of it. So uh, I would like a, a deep dive. I probably should watch a little bit of that before uh, my second watch on it. So. Uh, yeah. And curious. yeah, the first watch, you don't want to know all the behind this, you know, the, the yeah. magic, you know, you just want to no, for sure. take it in. Yeah. yeah. Um, Lily Gladstone, her Oscar nomination. I mean, the movie got a bunch of Oscar nominations, so that's, you know, unsurprisingly. So it's good to yeah. see that she was getting recognition because I remember her. She was pretty fantastic in it. So, yeah. What's so your, your, uh, there's probably your... way more to talk about since we haven't see, seen her talk to each other in like, you know, two months or whatever it's been. But uh, yeah. I'm uh, currently working on losing a little bit of weight because I have gained a lot over the holidays and running a lot. And I just did my yearly physical with my doctor, uh, which was awesome yesterday. I uh, love doing that because I, you know, hopefully get good results back and then feel good for the rest of the year. Um, I am working my ass off, uh, even though there's not really much going on. Like I, what, what is it about January? And maybe everybody can relate, you know, like it's oh, yeah. always so fucking slow. It's uh, a dead bump. And that's, I'm, I'm fine with that. So, I mean, you're crushing it. Uh, I love that Tom Skilling, um, painting. Oh, yeah. Uh, and I saw that he, he showed some, he threw some appreciation out for that. Right. On social yeah. media. Yeah. So for great. anybody out there who is not viewing this, um, I, did a painting of uh, Chicago legend Tom Skilling, weatherman, uh, to pay a little tribute to the man. He's been he's retiring after forty five years, and it's like you know, if you know anything about Chicago and its people, we are super, super, super ingrained in like our people and that have been there, tried and true for a long time. And Tom Skilling is certainly that. He has given so much to the city. You know, we've grown up with him. Uh, and so to see him retire is kind of bittersweet uh, for a lot of people. And I just wanted to do a little tribute. So he he's moving to Hawaii, uh, from what I heard. <laughs> really? I didn't yeah. Know that. So that's what this is. Uh, that's what this is. He's he, he's enjoying a, a, a old style beer uh, with pizza and hot dog. And he's in Hawaii with his Cubs hat on. So that's, that's my that's my tribute. That's so fucking funny though. It was like you've been dealing with and working on yeah. Chicago weather for forty five right. years. It's like, oh fuck this shit. I'm moving to Hawaii, so I don't have to deal with uh, this. It's kind of perfect, ones. right? <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I've been <laughs> doing that and just a lot of art, which is cool. You know, if it is slow uh, for other things, at least I can um, do this. A uh, lot of other stuff beyond the scenes that I've been doing in in. Uh, December and stuff like that, that I kind of, you know, uh, will be coming out soon. Um, working a lot with, the the teas, um, because they've, they've been on tour for the last four months. And so I went to yeah. go see them in orange County. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's been good. You know, I can't complain. It's just that sometimes as like, uh, I'm sure everybody out there that works this way, if you're in, um, you know, a, a little bit of a freelance mode. Right. So like I do a lot with my art, of course, and that's my main gig. Uh, but that sometimes is slow and meaning, you know, as far as getting into like galleries or selling art or whatever. So uh, I also do graphic design um, and, you know, art direction for different things. And that is what I'm talking about with the being slow, because, um, you know, usually I can, if, uh, you know, not doing this, painting wise i can do something there but i don't know january just seems like everybody's kind of like you know still figuring it out or something <laughs> getting dragged into the new year uh, but then you know like last night like i was saying a job comes in and then it's like holy shit i'm fucking slammed all of a sudden uh and i had I, but i was sat on my ass for a month you know it's like <laughs> 
You're like, I got all this work, but I still get to enjoy the juicy fruits for a few hours. So thank God. Yeah. And it, <laughs> thank God I had the juicy fruits last night. That was really fun. And uh, uh, yeah, that's it, man. Uh, so yeah, not, but good year so far. Hell yeah. Well, let's keep it going. So mm -hmm. uh, what are you listening to lately? Okay. So a lot. Uh, by the oh, way, nice. are, are everything good with you? Do you, I, I feel like we just glazed over you. you you're everything is good. Yeah. Oh, I mentioned I was on an alien and predator marathon. So that's right. my January. And so, so everything's great with you. I mean, envy of the internet clearly. Okay. So. <laughs> okay. Um, good. Yeah. So everything, uh, with my music has been pretty amazing. So, uh, up until I think, uh, the rollout started probably in November with the, when we were young fest, but I got to tell you, yeah, could not be more excited about a new green day record as I was for this one. And that's going to be my song of the week. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, but not just that. Alkaline Trio just released a record. Uh, Bayside is about to release a record. All these great bands that I love that like are kind of like always kind of put out some bangers uh, of records, you know, no matter what. Even if it's a dud, it's kind of still like you get excited for. So the the Alkaline Trio record is really good. I've listened to that a couple of times so far. It came out last weekend. Um, and then I'm just totally listening to this Green Day record um, over and over and over. It's like one of their best records they've done in years. And uh, <clears throat> I'm not sure if you've seen it, but um, they did. They released like a bunch of stuff. So the American Dream is Killing Me was their first single. And then Look Ma, I Have No Brains. And they have, all the videos have been really well done. I'm such a big fan of the way they've been rolling shit out with social media. Um, mm -hmm. Granted, they're a huge, you know band in the rock and roll hall of fame and they i'm sure they have a lot of money behind a lot of different things and of course they're such talented and legendary band that they've got all these opportunities to be on like fallon and everything but anyway they just really rolled it out the right way um but then they released the third single which is a song called dilemma which is the one that i'm going to pick here um and it's have you have you heard it i have not yeah okay so it's it's a song called dilemma and i would just say watch the video uh when you get a chance um i don't maybe i don't want to give away too much since you haven't seen the video and what the song's about it was definitely relatable i think to everybody um it's about drinking um and, or and or drug consumption no matter what your vice is um and the video is just like this was i've never i haven't seen things done this way kind of for coming from the perspective of like what you think it is and then kind of what it really is um and uh it opens really cool it's you know black and white and color and billy joe armstrong man what a fucking legend uh just like you know if anybody knows anything about me i've loved punk rock specifically the lookout records bands from back in the day um and to see green day like kind of just be the one that rose to the cream of the crop of all of those you know there's so many good bands that came out of that time operation ivy screeching weasel mr t experience but this band to continually make be making great music in this day and age and they all look like they're still fucking 20 years old which is amazing uh you know music art keeps you young right keeps you oh, yeah. keeps you fun and so uh, i couldn't be ha happier to have a new green day record and the song that i'm picking is dilemma take a listen and you know enjoy it hell yeah dilemma by green day uh i know they're playing wrigley i think this year oh that yeah. makes sense yeah it's arena yeah. tours i think they're doing they're yeah. doing it's also the 20 year anniversary of dookie but then i think 20 year or no, 30 years more than 20 more than 20 definitely 30, more than 20. Of, 30 of dookie and 20 of american idiot so yeah. they're doing both records back to back right that sounds right i, I remember seeing they were playing uh, at least one of those uh in full so I love the fucking years. What the fuck? I love the uh, record tours. Just uh, kind of a sideline. I love yeah. seeing a band play like a record from start to finish. Um, I feel like that's something that's always kind of been around, but in the last like 10, 15 years, that's like almost uh, uh, becoming a standard. Because I saw a splash so headline from uh, Alkaline Trio that were like, "We're not going to be lazy and do like a reunion uh, Alkaline Trio reunion uh, tour. It's about our new record." I was like, "Oh shit." <laughs> Like <laughs> they come out and say that, like, like it's kind of like, holy crap, you know? Yeah, I guess it, I mean, I'm, I'm not thinking of from their end being lazy, but it is, it no, is from I the guess fans perspective, that's what you want to see. Right. Yeah. yeah. And it depends on the artist. You know, if I saw, 
I don't know. I'm thinking if like Dylan played like a record from start to finish, he would never do that. But yeah, uh, and he would never even play the same way anyway. So yeah, I mean, I'm thinking of like how much of an awesome experience that would be, but it would just be depending on, uh, you know, how much of a single record kind of defines uh, your music career. So yeah, it is what it is. All right. Well, what have you been listening to? Uh, I came across this uh, band from the '80s called Lone Justice, kind of an alt country country slash rock and roll vibe uh the main singer maria mckee she has a very uh linda ronstadt dolly parton kind of uh vibe to her uh they put out two records in the 80s they're an la band they had a pretty uh rabid fan base like pretty quick uh but they were certainly not successful uh commercially at all so they really only had had the two records uh in the 80s and I think they had a reunion one later, but I haven't heard that one. Awesome alt country uh, vibes. Um, absolutely love the vi- uh, sound uh, that they had. Uh, I know they worked alongside like Tom Petty. I think he wrote one or two of their songs. Uh, I think their second album uh, was produced by Little Steven. Uh, so awesome band that I've kind of really just discovered that I had never heard of before. Uh, their first record from 1985, uh, self-titled Lone Justice. Uh, still very well revered i've seen it on a couple lists uh from like rolling stone writers as uh one of the better uh records uh of all time and uh if they put out a list of their own personal one 200 records and so yeah it's one that i had never heard of uh still doesn't seem too popular but uh, uh it definitely has uh their fan base lone justice so the song i'm going with is don't toss us away from 1985 and um yeah absolute great kind of country vibe which I'm all for, uh, especially lately, I feel like. And so, yeah, that's the record that I've been really loving a lot. Lately, cool. So. Can't wait to hear the song. That uh, sounds like a, you know, something that uh, we've missed over the years. Yeah. Like I said, like, I mean, it's, it was, it was 100% not on my radar, this record or the band itself, but yeah, uh, I don't even, yeah, clear I don't pedigree. Uh, and like I said, it's still kind of like Phantom of the Paradise. It's, it's one that's kind of gone on the radar, but it has a huge, uh, uh, a fan base that uh, they're pretty dedicated to them. So, well, how about that for full circle? Uh, oh, yeah. I, I listen, I gotta tell you, it's nice to be back with you. Sorry it took so long to get this. Uh, everybody out there, thanks for putting up with us on our crazy schedule. We try to do these every other week, but uh, sometimes I just get a little busy and we have to push them off, which is okay. You know, we're doing this and uh, we're loving it, and hopefully, you are too. But take a look at our social medias out there, we've got them all. Uh, give us a follow and of course give us your comments let us know your thoughts even if they're going to be snarky ones uh we enjoy reading them um lately uh the reason the snarky ones have been coming through is because um i connected us to youtube uh they've been doing a podcast thing where you can connect your your rss feed and people have been uh, able to find us uh like in a little bit of a better way since not all of our videos uh we not we didn't always do this in video form then we do both video and you know just audio only uh but the earlier episodes like the one that cm cushions uh commented on has been released now on youtube and so more people have been finding it which i love you know and um oh yeah maybe against our will uh we're going to be getting ai'd here um it looks like apple podcast is uh going to be doing um the cliff notes whether you like it or not on their um, platform. So, oh, you know, yeah. you'll be able to read the uh, um, transcripts coming up pretty soon. <laughs> nice. I mean, I was just thinking we've been getting AI, AI for a while, but now I'm thinking of what the, my transcript sounds like or looks like. So, which yeah, is always like, interesting. But, you know, whatever it is, uh, there's nothing you could do about it. <laughs> that's just, that's our future as uh, being, seeing the, your mirror reflection through the eyes of AI. So I'm just thinking, yeah, I mean, again, I'm I, having an existential moment with that right now. So it's so hard to see like what any of this stuff's going to be. But I mean, people, you know, the Internet, uh, computers, like all this kind of stuff, people are like, were frightened of, you know, before they started using it and it became the way of the world. So, yeah, I'm probably going to be something similar. It's just how we as human beings interact with it and use it instead of uh well, there's going to be the people that use it to cut corners, but then the real deal people will use it as uh, a benefit, you know? 
Well, I'm going to keep on using it to uh, uh, indulge in film appreciation, as we do here every time we talk, uh, which I absolutely love. So I'm definitely excited to continue with that. So, Well, on that note, we'll see you next time. Thanks for listening. Pat, always great to see you. Always great to have these great, sorry to say great a million times, but these amazing conversations with you about the movies uh wouldn't want to do it with anybody else and appreciate your time and your time out there listening love the movie love the ramon shirt love the paintings keep up the awesome work you too buddy we'll talk soon okay thanks see ya bye